Today, we are in for a unique experience. We have with us an extraordinary individual who is one of the most celebrated intellectuals in America today. He is a Yale University Honors graduate and the first African American to receive a PhD from the University of Cambridge in its 800 year history. His many honors include a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, a National Humanities Medal, and election to the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is currently the chair of Afro-American Studies and W.E.B. Du Bois Professor of Humanities at Harvard University. Without further ado, it is indeed my pleasure and an honor to introduce to you Dr. Henry Louis Gates. wonderful introduction and thanks to all of you for for coming it's an honor to be delivering the Warwick L Carter lecture for Black History Month you know what I really like though in this description on the back it says Dr. Carter served as Dean of the faculty and later as Provost Vice President for Academic Affairs from uh, 1984 to 1996 and then it says with the participation and support of his wife Laurel isn't that great that really because you know it's true I think Laurel ought to stand up Berkeley has a special place in my heart because um, one of my best friends, and as you'll uh, hear in a minute, um, my, one of my business partners, cr crucial for the um, successful completion of this project, was Quincy Jones. And I love Quincy Jones. Um, he's uh, such a good friend. Whenever I go to LA, it's just to have dinner with, with Q. And he remembers his years here fondly. I mean, he often talks about them. So uh, I hope you're honoring him too, in some sort of way. But it's great to be to be back here. Um, I pass by here all the time. I see all the students carrying instruments, lining up for concerts and, and uh, classes, but I've never lectured here before, so it's just it's a great honor to be here. You're doing very important and wonderful things. I want to tell you about, the title of my lecture is W.E.B. Du Bois and the Encyclopedia Africana, and I'm going to tell you about the history of this curious idea and then um, show you what I've been uh, blessed um, and fortunate enough to, to do with that idea. In 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black intellectual of all times, woke up one day, seeming, seemingly out of the blue, announcing that the most efficacious way to fight white racism would be the editing of a comprehensive encyclopedia about the entire black world, the equivalent of a black, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little cold, the equivalent of a black Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, Du Bois was a genius, so we, you know, he could have just had this idea on his own. But we do know where, well, at least I think, where he got the idea. Oh, it's the phone. Tell him I'm not here, whoever's uh, <laughs> calling on that phone, okay? Could you do me a favor? I'd really like to see my audience and make eye contact. So I wonder if you could turn the lights up. Would that be all right? Would, that wouldn't damage your filming, would it? Ah, uh, that's better. Now I can see people. I was just talking to shadows before. It's much better. Um, we found out recently that in 1907, the Encyclopedia Judaica was published. And so, you know, you don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to figure out that Du Bois saw all the good attention that was coming to the Jewish community and how the publication of that encyclopedia was helping the Jewish community fight anti-Semitism. And he wanted some of that for black people. So Du Bois decided that he wanted to do this great black encyclopedia, as I've said, the equivalent of a black encyclopedia Britannica. Just think about that. An encyclopedia, the publication of an encyclopedia would, he felt, he argued, he reasoned, help to fight um, white racism, anti-black racism. What a curious idea. Well, anyway, by 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois was a star. Um, but he didn't have any money. Now, why do I say he was a star? Well, in 1888, he had uh, graduated from historically black Fisk University. You see, Du Bois grew, grew up in the western part of the state in Great Barrington, and he always wanted to go to Harvard. But they wouldn't let him go to Harvard. They said, no, no, you've got to go to a black school and be seasoned first. Let's see how you do. And it was good because it immersed him in blackness. God knows he didn't get any immersion in black culture in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. <laughs> not today and not in 1868. You know, they still haven't recognized Du Bois 
in Great Barrington. They haven't recognized him sufficiently because he was so radical, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So he graduated from Fisk in 1888, and then he went to Harvard. He was accepted, and he got a second bachelor's degree. He got the A.B. degree in 1890, and he uh, majored in philosophy. In fact, he was William James's favorite student. And then in 1891, he got an A.M. degree in history, the first black person to do so. But then he wanted to go to Europe. You see, at that time, as quiet as, it, as it's kept today, you know, a degree from Harvard, degree from Yale, you know, that wasn't anything. I mean, if you wanted to be a scholar, you had to go to Europe. You had to go to some school that was five, six, seven hundred years old, not something uh, created in the 17th century like Harvard was. And more particularly, Du Bois wanted to study the nascent field called sociology, which didn't even exist in the United States. So he wanted to go to university in Europe, and more particularly, he wanted to go to university in Germany. He wanted to go to Berlin, to Humboldt um, University. So the Slater Fund, which was set up by um, um, a, a group of people to further the education of the Negro, as they put it. And Du Bois had to bombard them with letters so that they would give him a grant to go to Humboldt University, where he was accepted into the doctoral program. He basically had to, he had to beg, he had to cajole, he had to threaten. And finally, the Slater Fund, under the leadership of Rutherford B. Hayes, you know, former president of the United States, finally consented to give this young Negro from Harvard a grant. But it was a two-year grant, and therein lay a tale. So he went off to, to Berlin, and it changed his life. And he wanted to be the father of American sociology. He wanted to bring this nascent field of sociology back to the United States and become an academic. But after two years there where he ex excelled, um, he needed a third year in order to satisfy the residency requirement. So naturally, he wrote to the Slater Fund, and the Slater Fund refused to extend his grant. Can you believe it? So with the greatest reluctance and an enormous amount of bitterness, he returned to Harvard, where in 1895 he became the first African American to take a PhD from Harvard, in his case, um, in the field of history. In 1899, he published the first, one of the first, certainly, if not the first, studies of an American city from a sociological, um, a methodological point of view. And that was his famous book called The Philadelphia Negro. And he went door to door. I mean, he even measured black people's heads. I mean, he was an empiricist. And he wanted to establish the study of the Negro on the firmest scientific foundation, as he put it. And that was the the book called The Philadelphia Negro. In 1900, he wrote a sentence which turned out to be prophetic, one of the most famous sentences written by anybody in the entire 20th century, and that was that the problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. And that, Lord knows, turned out unfortunately to be the case. In 1903, he published a book that was heralded even as soon as the, uh, almost as soon as the, the ink was dry, as a classic. And that book is called The Souls of Black Folk, and it immediately became and, it, and continued throughout the 20th century and remains into the 21st century, the veritable Bible for uh, would-be young black intellectuals. And in it, he coined uh, two metaphors which proved to be dominant throughout black discourse and black literature in the 20th century. One was the double consciousness of the African-American. One ever feels his tune, as he said, an American, a Negro. And the second one was the metaphor of the veil, that if you were black, you lived behind a veil and others could not see you, but you could see them through the veil darkly, obviously a, a, a riff on uh, the New Testament, right? Um, and that metaphor became the, center, the central metaphor of Ralph Ellison's great novel published in 1952 called Invisible Man. So Du Bois um, um, was just a literary genius as well as a philosophical and political genius. In 1905, he co-founded, as a matter of fact, with a relative of mine, um, an organization called the Niagara Movement. And the Niagara Movement, which was dedicated to fighting the policies of Booker T. Washington, who was very conservative, as you know, on political issues, the Niagara Movement metamorphosed itself in 1910 into an organization called the NAACP. Do you realize that the, Du Bois was the only black person on the executive board of the NAACP when it was founded in 1910? I mean, we think of it as a black organization, but it was of uh, liberals, particularly liberal Jewish people, a coalition of liberal Jews, liberal uh, wasps, and liberal black people. And in 1910, Du Bois became the founding editor of the Crisis Magazine, which was then and remains to, to this day the official organ of the NAACP, and he served proudly and brilliantly 
in that capacity between 1910 and 1934. But this is 1909, when that morning when he woke up and decided that the editing of this comprehensive encyclopedia of the black world would be the most effective way to fight white racism. So as I said, he was a star, but he had no money. Uh, he had just enough money to print about 100 pieces of stationery announcing the birth of this project called the Encyclopedia Africana Project. And on that, he wrote to all these people around the world and asked them to be on his board of editors. He wrote to the great uh, anthropologist Franz Boas. And um, he, he wrote to Sir Harry Johnston, uh, the ethnologist um, in London. And he wrote to J.E. Casely Hayford, the um, great Pan-Africanist from the Gold Coast, which is now Ghana. And he, he wrote to the Italian scholar Giuseppe Sergi. And he wrote to some of his Harvard professors. He wrote to William James, the great um, the, uh, um, psychologist, the founder of American psychology, who was Du Bois' philosophy professor at Harvard because the discipline of psychology didn't exist at that time. Uh, he wrote to George Santayana, the great philosopher, with whom he read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. He tells us in his autobiography in an upper room in Harvard Yard, and that upper room is em Emerson Hall, which is still the home of the, the philosophy department today. He wrote to Albert Bushnell Hart, the historian uh, who had directed Du Bois's PhD dissertation in 1895. And he wrote to President Eliot, president of Harvard himself. And all of these people, um, uh, uh, including Max Weber, Max Weber, the great sociologist with whom Du Bois had studied at Humboldt in Berlin, all of these people wrote back, save one, and said that they would be honored to be on Du Bois's board of editors. And that one person, you might have guessed, was President Eliot of Harvard, who said he was much too busy trying to transform this boys' finishing school, which, after all, is all that Harvard was at that time, trying to transform this boys' finishing school into a grand <coughs> cosmopolitan, sophisticated center of higher learning. Much too busy doing that to accept an active role on a board of editors. But he wanted to give young Du Bois two bits of advice. First, he said, don't ignore the presence of Islamic religion and culture in sub-Saharan Africa. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I mean my um, respect for President Eliot of Harvard went up considerably when I found this letter. I didn't think he knew where Africa was or anything about Islamic <laughs> culture. I mean, how many Americans did? But he was absolutely right about that. As I learned, if I, I didn't know it intellectually, I learned when I made my six-part series for BBC and PBS called Wonders of the African World, Islamic Culture, it's fundamentally ingrained in, um, in um, African culture in its history for the past thousand years at least. And secondly, he, he warned young Du Bois, and this turned out to be prophetic advice, don't embark on this project unless you have the money. All right? Now remember that. Well, as I said, Du Bois went on a year later to found the NAACP and to become the editor of the Crisis Magazine. So he had to put the encyclopedia on the shelf. Besides, he couldn't get any money to um, get it off the ground. He wanted to do a four-volume encyclopedia consisting of two million words, okay? But he had his stationery, so, you know, he put, it, uh, he put it on the shelf and he decided he would come back to it. Well, cut to 1931. 1931, Anson Phelps Stokes happens to be a white man who founded the Phelps Stokes Fund a philanthropic organization, still in, um, it still exists, just moved from the east side of New York down to Washington. Anson Phelps Stokes wakes up one day and announces to his staff that he had had a dream the night before. And the dream was that the most efficacious way to fight white racism would be the editing of a comprehensive encyclopedia about the whole black world. And they were all excited. And he had a lot of money. Um, but so to get it off the ground, he convened a meeting on November 20th 1937, uh, I'm sorry, November 20th, 1931, on the campus of Howard University in the Carnegie Library at Howard. And he invited all these great black scholars to tell him about his idea and to organize this project under the name the Encyclopedia of the Negro. But he didn't invite W.E.B. Du Bois and he didn't invite Carter G. Woodson. Now, you all know who Carter G. Woodson is. You know even if you don't know. Carter G. Woodson, you don't know, was the second African American to take the Ph.D. in history from Harvard, but Carter G. Woodson also was the founder of Negro History Week in 1926. Negro History Week became Negro History Month, which became Black History Month, which became, when I was an undergraduate, Afro-American History Month, which today is African-American History Month, and in 20 years, I predict, will be Neo-Nubian History Month. <laughs> 
you know, I swear to God, when Jesse Jackson got in trouble with that young uh, staff person and uh, she had a baby, uh, I knew the brother was going to have a press conference and say the spirit of blackness has spoken to him and we had to change our names to Neo Nubians, you know. So every time Jesse gets in trouble, we change our names. I think that, um, think about it, we're the only group of people that keeps changing its name. The Chinese people have been Chinese people about 5,000 years. The Egyptians are still Egyptians, but we have to change our names all the time. I think somebody should do a paper on how much money it has cost us to change all that destroyed stationery, all those signs. You know, it's terrible. I don't know about you, but I am going to be an African American. I'm going out of here as an African American. I don't care what Jesse or anybody else <laughs> says. Well, that's Carter G. Woodson. But the other person he, whom he did not invite was W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, I love W.E.B. Du Bois. I have the pleasure, as you heard in that wonderful introduction, of being the Du Bois professor at Harvard. I revere him. It's like a fantasy for me. But, um, but how can I put this? Well, let me see. Harold Bloom was the great literary critic down at Yale. I was a Yaley, as you, I am a Yaley, proud Yaley, as, as you heard. Um, Harold Bloom used to lecture to, still does, cast a thousand in, the, in his poetry class. And he figures out some way to say the following line in each of his uh, classes. At one point during the semester, he'll look at you, and he's very histrionic. He'll say, they say we shouldn't speak ill of the dead. And he'll pause for effect, and he'll look at us again and say, they say we shouldn't speak ill of the dead. And then he'll look at his deadpan and say, but if we don't, who will? <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois, ladies and gentlemen, was the most arrogant Negro on the face of the earth. In times of intense intimacy, W.E.B. Du Bois allowed his second wife, Shirley Graham, to call him by his first name, which was Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> You know what the rap guys say? Who's your daddy? Du Bois is saying, who's your doctor, baby? Who's your doctor? <laughs> w. E. B. Du Bois slept in a three-piece suit. The uh, Benjamin Brawley, who got a master's degree from Harvard, black man, got a master's degree from Harvard in English in 1908, published the first sophisticated history of Negro literature, as he would have called it then. And the book was called The Negro Genius. And remember I said Du Bois was the editor of the Crisis Magazine. So if you publish a book and you were black, or if you were white and published a book about the black experience, getting it reviewed in the pages of the Crisis Magazine was like getting reviewed today in the New York Times or the Boston Globe. So everybody had to you know, send their books to Du Bois. So the joke we tell is that Brawley writes this book, The Negro Genius, wraps it up in brown paper, mails it to Du Bois in his uh, crisis office in Harlem. And Du Bois is sitting at his grand desk and he opens it painstakingly, and he holds it up, sees the title, ah, the Negro genius. Uh, Brawley has written a book about myself. <laughs> du Bois was the most arrogant Negro on the face of the earth. And when he heard that they had had this meeting without him, he went ballistic. So he wrote to Anson Phelps Stokes, and he said, how dare you have this meeting uh, without me? I conceived of the Encyclopedia Africana in 1909. I have all these letters from people from around the world, including Giuseppe Sergi and Max Weber, saying they'd be on my board. And in fact, I have the stationery to prove it, and he enclosed a piece of that stationery. So Anson Phelps Sooks had no idea. He thought that he had invented this idea, and he was very apologetic. Nobody wanted to mess with the great Du Bois. So he wrote Du Bois back, and he apologized profusely, and he quickly rescheduled a second meeting of the board of editors of the Encyclopedia of the Negro Project on the campus of Howard University, January 7th, 1932. And at the last minute, Dr. Du Bois allowed himself to be persuaded to attend that meeting. Carter G. Woodson um, refused to attend. And uh, at that meeting, Du Bois unanimously was elected editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of the Negro Project. And he served in that capacity between 1932 and 1946. Well, after 1934, he had a lot more time because he was fired from the board of the NAACP. Du Bois had written an essay called The Field and Function of the Negro College, in which he said that um, since the goalposts of the civil rights movement appeared to be receding, perhaps it would behoove the Negro to develop separate social, cultural, educational, economic, and political institutions until the goals of civil rights, that is, full integration in American society, could be realized. That ran counter to the ideologies, you might imagine, of the board of the NAACP under the direction of Walter White, who hated Du Bois, and Du Bois hated him. And um, White was a black man, though very fair, ironically enough. And um, fair meaning light-complected. 
Du Bois wouldn't have thought he was fair at all. <laughs> and um, so they insisted that he submit his resignation, which he, of course, did. And after 1934, he actively pursued the funding for this Encyclopedia of the Negro Project. Well, he wrote to all the foundations, even wrote to Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, who loved the cause of the Negro at that time. She was famous for that. And she insisted that her husband have a separate Negro cabinet, a black kitchen cabinet. But um, no one would give him any money for this project. People were afraid of Du Bois because he was so radical. And remember, he had just been fired from the board of the NAACP. So he went to Anson Phelps Stokes in 1937. He said, Stokes, you have to do something. I mean, you have money. We need $250,000. Remember, uh, particularly you students, it was the Great Depression. $250,000 was millions of dollars today at a time when there were soup lines and, and I mean, bread lines and soup kitchens. And what a frivolous thing to fund an encyclopedia project when you couldn't even get enough um, bread and, and, and uh, soup for, for people to, to eat. Um, but he went to Anson Phelps Stokes. Phelps Stokes said, you know you're right, and I'll make you a deal. I'll put up half the money. I'll put up $125,000 on a matching basis only, and that means one-to-one. -one. I'll give you a dollar if you raise a dollar. And he said, and Du Bois said, well, what good is that? I've, I've been talking to, I'm, I'm blue in my face to all these funders trying to get funding, and I haven't been able to do it. He said, I'll do more than that. I will intervene with um, Frederick Keppel, who was the president of the Carnegie Corporation. The Carnegie Corporation, despite its name, is a philanthropic organization, and it today is headed by Vartan Gregorian, who many of you know used to be president of Brown, very good man. It was the head librarian of the New York Public Library and, and happens to be a good friend of mine. And um, so he met with Keppel, and he said, Keppel, we have to do this for the Negro. And Keppel said, okay. He said, but don't tell Du Bois. He said, I'm having a meeting with my board, May 17th, 1937. And my board has to vouchsafe my decision. So don't tell them, because it's always possible that they won't go for it, but they always go for what I say. So, but you can't tell them, it's confidential. And Anson Phelps Stokes said, okay. And as soon as Keppel left Phelps Stokes' office, he picked up the phone and called Du Bois. And he said, Dr. Du Bois, Dr. Du Bois, you can't tell anybody, what I'm about to tell you is confidential. But May 17th, 1937, at three o'clock in the afternoon, the board of the Carnegie Corporation, Carnegie Corporation is going to meet, and at that meeting, they're going to vote to match my $125,000 grant to your project, and at 4 o'clock, they're going to call you. Now, when they call you, you have to be surprised, or I will have betrayed my confidence. Du Bois promised. So Du Bois then picked up the phone and called Rayford Logan. Now, Rayford Logan you haven't heard of, but he was the third black man to get a Ph.D. in the history department at Harvard. And like Carter G. Woodson and like W.E.B. Du Bois, Harvard man in history. But unlike Carter G. Woodson and unlike W.E.B. Du Bois, Rayford Logan at one time was engaged to Letitia Gates of Patterson's Creek, West Virginia. And Letitia Gates is my great aunt. So I got to know Rayford Logan very, very well. And he told me the following story, which was never in print until I put it there. He said that Du Bois didn't tell him why to come to his office at 3 o'clock. And Du Bois did not suffer fools gladly. He did not suffer fools at all, as a matter of fact. And he hated the stereotype of black people always being late. I have also learned that musicians... Uh, <clears throat> CP time, color people time, is also musician time, you know. <laughs> but um, so Logan told me, he stood outside the door, he watched the little second hand go around to hit the 12, and he tapped on Du Bois' door right on time. And he walked in. And to his astonishment, Du Bois, who had a beautiful mahogany desk sitting in the corner of his office, um, on that desk sat a silver ice bucket. Ice bucket was full of ice, and a vintage bottle of a bottle of vintage champagne sat chilling in the ice bucket. And next to the ice bucket sat two cut glass champagne flute glasses. And Logan didn't know what was going on. He told me he was afraid Du Bois was going to fire him. He didn't know why he'd been summoned to this office, because everyone was terrified of the great Du Bois. And Du Bois said, Logan, Logan, sit down. He said, see that clock? He said, at 3 o'clock, um, right now, the board of the Carnegie Corporation is meeting. And at 4 o'clock, they're going to call us and tell us they have matched on a one-to-one -one basis Anson Phelps Stokes' generous offer of $125,000. So we will be able to do the Encyclopedia of the Negro. We will make history. And so they sat there and slapped five, or come to think of it, I don't think Du Bois slapped much five in his lifetime. But they did whatever Du Bois did when Du Bois was happy, which was not a whole hell of a lot, <laughs> over the next hour. And they waited anxiously for the clock to turn to strike four. 
Finally, 4 o'clock came. No phone call. 4.15, no phone call. 4.30 comes and goes. The phone still hasn't rung. 4.45, 4.50. Finally, at five minutes to five, Du Bois looks at the clock. He looks at the ice bucket. He reaches over and grabs the, a bottle of vintage champagne by the neck, looks at Logan, yanks the bottle out of the ice bucket and slams it against the bookcase behind his desk. The phone never rang. He had been lobbied against by Carter G. Woodson. See, in those days, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there was animosity between African-American intellectuals. I'm pleased to say none of that exists today. <laughs> Where's Malefi Asante when I, when I need <laughs> Front page of the Baltimore Afro-American, one of the two or three leading black newspapers in the United States at the time, September 26, 1936, Carter G. Woodson accused W.E.B. Du Bois of stealing the idea of the encyclopedia from him. He said that he had had the idea in 1921, and he had published the idea in the pages of the Journal of Negro History, which he had founded. Well, I and a zillion other scholars have looked for that announcement, and it just is not there. And as a matter of fact, as we know, Du Bois had the idea in 1909. Du Bois was mortified. He never responded publicly, but he wrote to all of these potential funders privately and said that he had had the idea in 1909, and uh, he could prove it because he had the stationery announcing the project, and he enclosed a piece of stationery for those people um, to whom he was defending himself. Well, and as I said, Du Bois had been fired from the board of the NAACP, and that was a very powerful group of black and white people by 1934, so everybody was lobbying against Du Bois getting this grant. In 1940, he published a couple essays in his new journal at Atlanta University called Phylon um, Magazine, putatively from the Encyclopedia of the Negro, including an essay on Alexander Pushkin. I don't know if you all knew, but Alexander Pushkin is a, you're all of African descent, just a long way back. But Alexander Pushkin was of immediate African descent. His grandfather was um, Peter Hannibal, Peter's Hannibal. Peter the Great brought an African back from Africa and made him a general and forced a member of the Pushkin family, uh, forced the Pushkin family, a noble family, to pick one of their daughters to, to marry him. And Alexander Pushkin was the grandson of that um, relationship, and Du Bois published that article. But the encyclopedia was dead. In 1946, they uh, finally buried the project after Du Bois in 45 had published a bibliography called the preliminary um, volume to the Encyclopedia of the Negro um, Project, which consisted of lists of books relevant to different potential subjects if one ever were able to raise enough money to do the encyclopedia. But that volume, which I have a copy of, is very rare. I have a copy of the first edition and the second edition. That volume is very valuable because of the introductory essay by Du Bois called On the Need for an Encyclopedia of the Negro, which became my kind of Bible. Well, cut to 1951, what's happening in America, it's the McCarthy era, famous photograph of Du Bois on the page, front page of the New York Times being hauled off in chains. He had been accused of being a communist. He wasn't a communist. He stood trial. He was acquitted. But his passport was confiscated, just as it was for many Americans on the left, including Paul Robeson, you know, the greatest voice of all, as far as I'm concerned, in the history of black men. 1958, as a result of, um, um, 1957, as a result of a class action suit, Du Bois and everybody else get their, got their passport back. Uh, what's the first thing Du Bois does? He visits every communist country on the face of the earth. He went to Prague to the great Charles University where he got an honorary degree. And then he went to Berlin. And I have pictures of this ceremony on my, the wall of my office um, when he got that doctorate degree. They gave it to him at Humboldt. And he said that was the happiest day of his life. He went to Moscow uh, where Khrushchev gave him the Lenin Prize. And then he spent six months in China with Mao and with Zhou Enlai. Until recently, Du Bois' birthday was a national holiday in China. On the way back, he was approached by Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was the first president of the Independent Republic of Ghana. Ghana was the second African nation to decolonize itself. Sudan in 1956, Ghana in 1957. Kwame Nkrumah had studied at historically black Lincoln University, and he had shared a uh, platform with Du Bois in Manchester, England in 1945, 
at the second Pan African, at the third, I'm sorry, Pan African Congress. And uh, everybody revered Du Bois. Du Bois was the man because he was a great Pan Africanist and he fought early on for the decolonization of the African continent. So Nkrumah wrote to him and said, Dr. Du Bois, whatever happened to that Encyclopedia of the Negro Project, that Encyclopedia Africana Project that you were always talking about? And Du Bois, du Bois told him the same sad story that I've told you. And then Nkrumah wrote him back and said, why don't you move to Ghana and edit it on free African soil and I will fund it. And so in 1961, ladies and gentlemen, incredibly, at the age of 93, W.E.B. Du Bois and his second wife, Shirley Graham, did three things. They joined the Communist Party. <laughs> they renounced their American citizenship, and they jumped on a plane and flew to Accra, Ghana, where he established something called the Secretariat for the Encyclopedia Africana. Well, on December 15, 1960, excuse me, December 15, 1962, at the only meeting of the Board of Editors of the Encyclopedia Africana Project, Du Bois um, had scholars from all over the African continent. And he told them about the first two incarnations of the project, 1909 and 1932 to 46. And then he said, this, the third um, incarnation would be different from the first two. You see, the first two were truly pan-African. The African in the old world, the African in the new world. This, the third incarnation, would be, and I quote, by, for, about, and of the African on the African continent. Du Bois had felt betrayed by the American Negro leadership when he was um, persecuted by uh, the McCarthyites. And the civil rights leadership, I mean, even they thought Du Bois was a communist. And they were always shying away. You know, J. Edgar Hoover was bugging them and accusing them of being communist-inspired and influenced. And they just let Du Bois dangle um, out there in, in the wind, and Du Bois deeply resented it. So in response, he cut the American Negro <laughs> out of the encyclopedia. <laughs> this encyclopedia was only going to be about Africans on <coughs> the African continent. And he said perhaps it was only fitting that his first two attempts had come to naught. Because the full realization of this encyclopedia had to depend on the liberation of the African continent. Remember in 1960 alone, 17 African nations became independent. I was 10 years old and I remember that. I became obsessed with Africa that year. And I don't know why, because nobody else in my family was obsessed with Africa. As quiet as, as it's kept today, you know, black people were not walking around with Afros and dashikis talking about Habadigani and all this other kind of stuff. Black people were as embarrassed about Africa as white people were, and by and large. And if you, if you doubt me, just go back and read the script Raisin in the Sun. Remember that? It premiered Broadway in 1959. The protagonist brings home an African, and the family goes crazy. They say, are you out of your mind? You know, bringing one of those Africans, you know, into our, we ain't, we're every year at the, my mother is a, was a Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, that's our, my mother's family name. And every year, the last Saturday in July, the Coleman family, since 1949, has had a family reunion at our place on the Potomac River, about two hours now, about two hours west of D.C. And every year we give these gag gifts, and one of the gifts is, the I Ain't Left Nothing in Africa prize. <laughs> and my father gets it every year. I don't know why. I became, maybe as, as a, um, a rebellion against my father, but I became obsessed with Africa that year. Anyway, um, du, so Du Bois had his encyclopedia. Cut to August 1963. What's the biggest event in the whole world in August 1963? The March on Washington. The night before the March on Washington, the doctor sat down at his desk in Accra, Ghana, and he wrote out a message to Martin Luther King Despite his animosity toward the American Negro civil rights leadership, he really liked King, and King revered him. And the next day, Dr. King gave that great speech, I Have a Dream, and immediately following, the uh, MC, who was Roy Wilkins, the secretary of the NAACP at the time, addressed the crowd, and he read the contents of the cable, and then said that Dr. Du Bois had written the cable, had gone to sleep, and never woke up again. He died in his sleep. Well... I went off to um, Yale University in September 1969. I had a two-foot-high afro. You have to imagine that afro on this little peanut head. <laughs> my daughter Maggie, who's a senior at Wesleyan, saw my uh, uh, graduation picture in the, uh, the Yale banner, our uh, yearbook, and he, she said, Daddy, is that you? I said, yeah. She said, you look just like a Klingon. <laughs> I said, baby, I was a good-looking Klingon. <laughs> I had a closet full of dashikis, you know, we had a soul handshake. They changed it every month to make sure you were still black. It took about 15 minutes. You had to kick somebody in the butt and bump elbows. And 
Hello, my brother. Hello, my sister. You know, all that kind of stuff. It, it was wild. Um, and we were all looking for heroes. And I found uh, Dr. Du Bois. And I heard about this encyclopedia. And I was pre-med and pre-law both. I was um, pre-med around my mother and I was pre-law around my daddy. And the idea that I'd ever become a scholar just didn't even occur to me. Um, but I decided what a hoot it would be to edit that encyclopedia because encyclopedias played, played a big role in my education and in my family. My family, we still have it, 1956 World Book, sold to us by the school principal. Now, you talk about intimidation. That is probably illegal now, right? I mean, what are you going to do when the school principal comes and says you got to buy the encyclopedia? you got to buy the encyclopedia. But thank God they did because we looked everything up. You know, when, they, when Jeopardy came on and the College Bowl and all these things, we would run to the encyclopedia and have big arguments. It was great, and I love encyclopedias, and I, I have a small collection of antique encyclopedias, including the, the um, rare uh, 1911 edition of um, Britannica that was so good. You know, Freud on psychoanalysis. I mean, it's a serious encyclopedia. Albert Einstein on, you know, whatever. It, it's just it's a great encyclopedia. So anyway, um, <clears throat> I decided I wanted to do that encyclopedia. So I got um, I took a year off between my sophomore year and my uh, junior year at Yale. I got a fellowship. There was a special program. In those days, Mr. President, you would reward students for taking longer to graduate, not shorter. And this program is called the five-year BA. And I went to um, Tanzania, and I worked in a mission hospital in an Anglican, you know, an Episcopalian. It's the Anglican Church worldwide. Uh, it's my family, Gates family, Episcopalians. And um, I worked in a little bush hospital with 120 beds for 50,000 people. No running water, no electricity. Everybody lived in mud huts. You know, it was, I used to write my friends back at Yale, and I'd say, please write to me, because <laughs> I, I love to read. You know, there was nothing to do. It was you t ent entirely uh, cut off. Kerosene lanterns to light your way at, at night. It was a great experience, but it was painfully lonely. But I, I learned a lot about Africa. And then I went into Dar es Salaam, the capital, and I was sailing with a fishing crew in a DAO, D-H-O-W, an area, air, Arab fishing vessel, to Zanzibar. And at the dock, you know, for a dollar, you could sail over to Zanzibar. And at the dock, I met a white guy who had just graduated from Harvard and had been kicked out of what was then called Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia, for, um, you know, being politically subversive, just probably by shaking a black man's hand or something at, at that time, because Southwest Africa was an apartheid culture just like South Africa was. Anyway, he told me his story, and he said that his dream had been to go from, to go from Cape to Cairo which it was Cecil Rhodes' great dream, to have a white civilization from, Cape, all the way, from the Cape all the way up to Cairo. And I told him my fantasy had been to hitchhike across the equator. So there on a starry night in the middle of the Indian Ocean in a dhow, great sails above us, um, we flipped a coin, and I won. So he and I hitchhiked across the equator. So by the time I was 20, I had gone from the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean without ever leaving the ground right across the African continent. I almost died doing it because I got very severe amoebic dysentery. But um, it was just the trip of a lifetime. So I loved Africa. So I got a fellowship my senior year to go to the University of Cambridge. I was going to come back and go to law school. I, in fact, I did. I came back and went to Yale Law School. I attended the Yale School of Law from September 1st, 1975 to October 1st, 1975. <laughs> At which point I took a leave of absence and the last time I checked, I was still on leave. <laughs> but I went to Cambridge because um, all I knew when I was growing up was that smart people went to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, and Yale. And that's, I, wanted, I thought people told me I was a smart kid and I wanted to get those credentials. And I went to Cambridge and it changed my life in many ways. But one way it changed my life is I met two Africans. One's name was Wally Shoyinka, W-O-L-E. Second name, S for Sam, O-Y-I-N-K-A. And the other was Kwame Anthony Apia. Wally Shoyinka was a Nigerian uh, playwright who had been imprisoned during the Biafran War between 67 and 69 and had been um, um, placed in solitary confinement for 24 out of 27 months and uh, almost killed several times. And he had gotten out of prison and written a prison memoir called The Man Died. And it was so controversial, the government was trying to kill him all over again. So he fled to England where he became a professor in the socioanthropology department. The social anthropology department, why would a playwright be in that department? Because the English department refused to give him an appointment because they said African literature was at best anthropology or sociology, but it was not literature. And they refused to give him an appointment as a faculty member. 
1986, Wally Shoyinka got the Nobel Prize for Literature. Okay? He was my introduction to African literature. And then a young African prince, literally a prince, a prince of a person metaphorically, but literally a prince, because his uncle was the, is, well, just died, was the Asantehini, the king of the Asante or Ashanti people in uh, Ghana. His symbol of authority was a gold stool, which descended from heaven in the 17th century to um, signify the God's approval on the royal family of the Ashanti. That's a bad story right there. I happen to like that. The brothers know how to tell a story. And Anthony was the son of uh, uh, Peggy Cripps, who was Sir Stafford Cripps' um, daughter. He was the chancellor of the exchequer in the uh, post-World War II labor government. And the nephew of the king of the Ashanti, he was a blue blood, an aristocrat from two sides. It was the first international interracial aristocratic marriage, and he was a splendid offspring. And we became best friends, um, and many of you who followed the uh, contretemps between Cornell West and Larry Summers at Harvard last year know that it led to not only Cornell leaving to go to Princeton, but also Anthony Appiah, which has broken my heart without a doubt, because Anthony and I have been together since that day in October when we met. So anyway, Shoyinka invited us one night to an Indian restaurant. I'm an Indian food junkie. I love Indian food. My friends say, I have two lips. This one's Madras and this one's Vindaloo. And I could eat Indian food three times a day. Um, and so Shoyinka took us to an Indian restaurant. And now, I don't know about you all. I'm not interested in your personal business. But let me tell you that, um, or I should say this, Shoyinka is quite a connoisseur of wine. And so, and his idea of how much wine it is appropriate to consume is directly proportional to the number of people at the table. If there are three people at the table over the course of an evening, that means a bottle of wine apiece. As he protested when he heard me talk about this once in public, he said, you give people the wrong impression. I don't think there should be one bottle for each person. I just think over the evening, we all should consume one bottle apiece. I said, oh, I would never be so vulgar as to suggest that, Wally. <laughs> I had never drunk wine before. In my day, we didn't drink wine to get high. <laughs> wine was something that we used to fill hookahs with. And we used to buy such vintage um, wines as Mad Dog 2020 and Purple Jesus and Pink Pussycat. Uh, you know, wine wasn't something you drank. It was something you smoked. <laughs> So here I was with this African prince raised in England, this guy who was destined to get the Nobel Prize. Even then, we believed that. And there was a little old me representing the American Negro people. So I was there trying to keep up with these guys drinking this wine. I acted like I drank wine every day. So I got drunk as a skunk. And I was about ready to, um, and then plus, I had all this Indian food. I, I didn't, wasn't in love with Indian food that, until that day. But the Indian food was so hot, because these Africans like this hot food. I'm sorry it's a stereotype, but it's true. And so I was there. My head was hurting, going around in circles. Tears were running down my face. My nose was running. It was disgusting. And I was there trying to shovel this food in, thinking, Lord, deliver me from these Africans. <laughs> and so finally, to recuperate my position, I asked them if they had ever heard of W.E.B. Du Bois of the Encyclopedia Africana. And they all, of course, had heard of Du Bois, but they had never heard of the Encyclopedia Africana. And that night, we made a drunken pledge that we would edit Du Bois' Encyclopedia, we would fill that dream. Now, we had no chance of ever doing this. But I went on to get a PhD at the University of Cambridge in English, and I'm um, sure Inca was my mentor, my advisor. He's my uh, um, older daughter's godfather, and Anthony Appia is my younger daughter's godfather. And um, I started it, trying to do this project in 1979. Uh, I wrote to the Encyclopedia Britannica Company, the vice president of which was Charles Van Doren. You know who Charles Van Doren was? Remember Quiz Show? That's Charlie Van Doren. Charlie Van Doren will be remembered for two things. He'll be remembered for the Quiz Show scandal, and he'll be remembered for being one of the truly great encyclopedists of the 20th century. As soon as he was fired, at the time when that revelation was made, he was vice president of NBC, and he was fired the next day. And the next day, Mortimer Adler, the philosopher, hired him to be the editorial director at Encyclopedia Britannica. And it was he who was responsible for that micropedia, macropedia, renovation, innovation in the form of Britannica, which we all, um, you know, we take for granted today. And he's a charming, brilliant man who made a terrible mistake in, a, in his life, unfortunately, about which he's deeply sorry and apologetic. But anyway, um, I wrote to them and, uh, you know, they wrote me back eventually and they said, um, we'll do your encyclopedia if you can raise $20 million 
dollars. They said, can you raise $20 million? I said, I can raise $20 million. And uh, I raised, ladies and gentlemen, $50,000, which is not bad if you're a 29-year-old, freshly minted PhD from the University of Cambridge, right? Just enough money to convene a meeting of the Board of Editors at Yale, where I was an assistant professor, and I flew Sharyanka and a couple other African scholars over from the continent, and you know, I talked up the project, and I was very self-confident we were going to raise $20 million, just enough to fund that meeting, and I'm pleased to say, to print some stationery <laughs> announcing, <laughs> announcing my project. Well, you know, I couldn't raise $20 million. <clears throat> In 1991, I came to Harvard to, with Anthony Appiah to rebuild Afro-American studies. By 1995, we had stolen Cornell West from Princeton, and we had wrapped a big red ribbon around uh, William Julius Wilson, the great sociologist from the University of Chicago. Nobody believed we could recruit him. We, when we recruited him, we were smoking. I got Gerald Levin at Time Warner to endow, give us $3 million to endow Quincy Jones Professorship of African American Music, the first chair of its kind endowed in the United States. Um, our endowment, which was basically zero when Anthony and I came in um, 1991, today is $40 million, and so by that time it was well on its way. We had been very successful, and I was feeling really self-confident, and so I said to Kwame, Anthony, um, let's blow the dust off the encyclopedia. Let's strike. So I went down to um, um, Random House. Now, by this time, when I went to Random House, that was my trade publisher, I had um, something in my pocket, as we say. And what was in my pocket came from Quincy Jones. When I published, I published a piece in the New York Times in 1992 on anti-Semitism in the black community. It was very controversial. Farrakhan <laughs> put a, you know, there was a death <laughs> you know, warrant. I don't know what the right thing. They, all these anonymous calls, they were going to kill me and all this stuff. And um, once I was lecturing at Emory and I was backstage and two of my friends who were black guys I'd known from Yale were on the faculty of Emory came back to see me and they were very nervous and I couldn't figure out why they were so nervous. And um, two seconds before I was about to go on, while the introduction was being made, a policeman came up and said, um, Professor Gates, we just thought you might like to know that there are busloads of black Muslims out in the audience, but we covered your back. We're covering your back. I was thinking, shit, my back? What about my front? You, know? <laughs> you try to step out on a, an audience when somebody tells you that, the last thing you've heard in your ear before you go out to give your speech, right? I must have lost 20 pounds. I was trying to be cool, though. You know? <laughs> um, but anyway, because of that article, Gerald Levin, the former CEO of um, Time Warner, wrote to me and asked me to come down and have dinner. And then he said, we had a great dinner, and he said he wanted me to fly out to Hollywood and brainstorm with some of the division heads at Warner and the, the TV units and things like that, HBO, all of that. So I went out, and at the end of the day, I met a guy named Quincy Jones. And um, I had asked the host, was I having dinner with Mr. Jones? And they said, no, no, Mr. Jones is very busy, but he will see you for 20 minutes. And we got on so well that he invited me up to his house, which is on Bel Air Place. You know, it's one of these fantasy kind of Hollywood houses. And um, I couldn't believe it. I mean, it was one of the greatest meal of my life was with Quincy Jones. And that night, we were sitting by a swimming pool, and Quincy likes to drink. Um, he loves wine, but he was, we were drinking, uh, what was that he liked? Cranberry juice and vodka. You know, it was just like, so I was totally, you know, enjoying myself. And um, he asked me if I had ever had a fantasy that I couldn't fulfill. And I said spontaneously, thousands, Quincy. He said, not that kind of fantasy, dummy. <laughs> He said, an intellectual fantasy. And I told him the same story I've been telling you about the Encyclopedia Africana. And he said, I've always wanted to do, be part of doing that project. He said, but I didn't know what it was called. And I said, it's called an encyclopedia, Q. <laughs> and he said, I'll give you some development money if you can get an encyclopedia company or somebody else to, to match it. And so I went down to Random House, and I made my pitch. I told him all about Du Bois and the stationery and everything. And the, uh, Alberto Vitali, the CEO, interrupted me, and he said, look, save all that. We'll give you some development money on one condition. And I told him I had some um, um, backing of Quincy Jones. And he said, um, the one condition is you have to do it on a CD-ROM. You can do it, he looked at me in the eye, on CD-ROM, can't you? And I said, without missing a beat, absolutely. Um, no problem. And then I said to him, but tell me, we can do it on CD-ROM, but why do you want us to do it on CD-ROM rather than a book, as a book? 
And he told me a story which is now part of uh, case studies in business school. And that is that in 1990, the Encyclopedia Britannica Company enjoyed the biggest profit in its history. In 1991, a computer geek from Redmond, Washington, bought all the rights to Funk and Wagnall's Encyclopedia. Remember Funk and Wagnall's? The funkiest encyclopedia on the market. You could get it the AMP and you buy a volume a month, right? <laughs> Gates bought the whole thing. And he put bells and whistles to it and he made up a, a, a neologism. It's like Hagen does in Carta. That's the encyclopedia. And it was shrunk to one little disc. And that encyclopedia, remember this is 1995, put Britannica out of business. Vitaly said it's confidential, but in six months, Britannica is going to announce that they're completely bankrupt. And you remember, they fired their whole sales force, they went bankrupt. Now they're back in business. But he said, so you've got to do it on CD ROM. So with a straight face, I took their money. I left there that day um, with $125,000 to do a prototype of the CD ROM. So I got in the, um, you know, what's Johnny Cash said? You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. I didn't let on. I just left my little money. I got in the elevator. I went down, you know, a very dignified way down to the first floor. Random House is 201 East 50th Street on the east side. And um, I came out of the big skyscraper and I walked across the street to a phone booth, <laughs> one of those open phone booths. I looked to make sure none of them were around. And I called Kwame back at Harvard Square. And I said, Kwame, Kwame. I said, man, we got the money. We're going to do um, we, we, got, we, we, we can do a prototype for the encyclopedia. And as he said, that's wonderful. I said, there's only one problem. Uh, only two problems. <laughs> he said, what's that? I said, what's a CD-ROM? <laughs> I swear to God, this is true. I said, what's a CD-ROM? And can we do one? And he said, we can do one. So we hired two guys out of the Rhode Island School of Design. And six months later, we had a prototype. So I flew all of the executives from Random House up to Harvard. Had a letter from the president. I had the provost of Harvard there in the room. He gave him a speech about Du Bois is part of the Harvard tradition. Oppie and Gates are part of the Harvard tradition. This has the university's blessing. I did my little demo. It was smoking, man. It was bad. I got a standing ovation after 45 minutes. And I sat down and started counting my money. I said, I got my $2 million. Because by now, Du Bois is $250,000 and turned it into $2 million. That's what we need. And Alberto Vitale stood up and he said, you guys have done a wonderful job with our investment. I'm sure Mr. Jones is pleased. I'd flown out and shown it to Quincy. He was very happy. And he said, that's the good news. My head popped up from my revelries counting my money. And I said, the good news. He said, the bad news is that in the last six months, the bottom has fallen out of the market for CD-ROM reference works. He said, if you can do it as a game, So, you know, I'm a very up person, I, and I have, you know, I've been very lucky and blessed in my life. But I had to blink back to tears because I really wanted to cry. My, my $2 million was <laughs> walking out of the room, <laughs> flying back to New York. So, you know, I decided that this was a doomed project. I mean, it was never going to get off the ground. I decided that until maybe the next morning. And then uh, I started approaching all the publishers in New York City. I pounded the pavements of New York for the next couple of years. I have a box of 25 rejection letters. Every major publisher in the United States turned me down. Everybody loved the idea until I told them I needed $2 million and their eyes would kind of glaze over. And I have all those rejection letters. And then finally I decided to throw a Hail Mary pass to Bill Gates. You know, all these black people want to be related to Thomas Jefferson. They can have Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> <laughs> Even as we speak, I have the Mormons busy looking for that connection between <laughs> William Gates and Henry Gates. <laughs> and when I find it, I'm not going to embarrass the brother. I'm going to show up. I'm going to say, uh, this woman's going to say, uh, may I help you? I'm going to say, you tell Cousin Bill that Skip is here. <laughs> 10 million, I'm out of your life, brother. No National Enquirer, nothing like that. <laughs> to my astonishment, he caught my Hail Mary pass, and they flew me out, Anthony and I, and Charles Van Duren, we flew out there and did the demo, and it was, they, they were on, you know, but they said they wanted to do a marketing survey. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, because they didn't want it to be a philanthropic endeavor. They wanted, and I, I said, well, what's the marketing survey consist of? And they said they wanted to count the number of black people who had computers because that would be our market. So, you know, I thought about this all the way back from Seattle to Logan. And when I landed, you know, I went back to my office and went home. Next day, went back to my office. I called all my friends who were black, and I gave them uh, Bill Gates' email. And I said, you write to him and say, I am black. 
I have a computer. <laughs> Six months comes and goes, no call from Microsoft. So, you know, I figured, well, that was it. So to my um, astonishment, a friend of mine, Peggy Cooper Kafer, it's a black woman who is the, uh, pre now the president of the Board of Editors, uh, I mean the Board of Editors, the um, Board of Education in D.C., said that a mutual friend, Frank Pearl, uh, with whom I'd done a project several years before, was founding a publishing company, which is now Perseus Books. And he was looking for a grand project to, to garner a lot of publicity. And that I should pitch the idea, you know, because all my friends knew about this idea. I'd go to a cocktail party, I'd have one drink, and I'd say, 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois. And um, so for the 26th time, I, I made the pitch to Frank Pearl. He had a suite at the Carlisle Hotel where Bobby Short plays and uh, Earth Kid sings. And um, I went down, he had a big suite, and he had a big king size bed. I just saw it in my mind. I sat on that bed with my little jive computer, and I. Um, made my pitch for the 26th time, and he said, this is great, he said. How much would this cost? And this is where I always lost people. So I said, $2 million. And he stuck out his hand and he said, you got a deal. And I said, don't mess with me, Frank. <laughs> he said, you got a deal. And I said, well, well, I'm waiting here for Microsoft. They want to do it on CD-ROM maybe, but I haven't heard anything. And da -da -da, you know, I'm so unprepared. And he said, well, if they come through, I'll give you a million dollars to do it as a book. They give you a million dollars. They'll do it on CD-ROM. We'll publish them at the same time. Went back to Harvard that night, got Anthony. We partied, man. We felt so good. The next day at 2 o'clock, Joanne, my secretary, Joanne Kendall, buzzed me and said, Microsoft's on the line. So I knew it was the brush off. So I picked up the phone. I was very cocky. You know, I was about to say, well, I don't need you. You know, I got my money now. And they said, we have great news. We completed our marketing survey, and you got a deal. In 24 hours, I had $2 million. Advances. You know, an advanced student is a loan. <laughs> My great-grandchildren, the Microsoft contract, we get 6% of net. Now, this thing sells for about $40, $45. You know what the net is? A buck fifty. That's what it costs. All the rest of it is profit for Microsoft and somebody else. So we get 6%. I mean, it would be 10,000 years before my estate and my descendants ever pay off that advance. But the point is that we could do it. But the only caveat was that we had to do it in 18 months. So I wrote to... 400 scholars all around the world, and I told them, I hired a staff, 45 people, we set up an office at Harvard Square, and 18 months later, to the day, we shipped, as they say in Microsoft parlance, we shipped not 2 million words, ladies and gentlemen, but 2.25 million words to Microsoft, and on January 19th, Martin Luther King's birthday, 1999, dedicated in memory of W.E.B. Du Bois and in honor of Nelson Mandela in Carta Africana was born. And now I'd like to show it to you. Thank you very much. you have to leave, um, well, I'm, I'm going to culminate this with the, our music timeline, but I'll do, um, I don't know, is, can most of you stay for a few more minutes? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, then I won't, I'll, I'll save that till the end. Uh, the encyclopedia, this is the third edition, it's now in its fifth edition. Um, it sells about, in its standalone edition, it was selling about 30,000 to 50,000 copies a year, but that's not enough for Microsoft um, to be a successful, a commercially successful product. So I persuaded them to incorporate it into what's called Encarta Reference Library, which many of you have. So you get it on a DVD, it has five products, and it one of those products, excuse me, is Africana. Why would I want to do that? Well, one, it will guarantee its existence in perpetuity. Secondly, middle-class white family in the suburbs goes out to buy Encarta's reference library, and they get the black world whether they want it or not. <laughs> That's a power position to me. And so instead of 30,000 copies a year, we sell 200 to 300,000 copies a year as part of that reference library. Now, my dad, whom you heard a little bit about, will be 90 years old, God willing, in June. He lives out in Lexington. He's got a 77-year-old girlfriend. 
his uh, fondest ambition is to bump Bob Doe off those Viagra commercials. <laughs> if my dad were here, he'd be hitting on all the women in here. <laughs> it's true. For my father, the greatest day in the history of the Negro, as he puts it, is not the day that Dr. King said, I have a dream. And it's not the day Nelson Mandela walked out of prison. It's this day. And I put this footage in here in honor of my father. In the eighth, Wirtz is up again with two men on run out. And there it goes. Back, back, back. Who will forget that great catch and throw by Willie May? It is amazing. It's a virtual black Smithsonian. We have thousands of audio and film clips just like that. Um, those of you who love the dance know how hard it is. Sorry, I got to do this with one finger because I got to hold this. Um, how hard it is to explain nonverbal um, things. Sorry, wrong, wrong one. We could watch Jackie Robinson slide in the home run, slide in the home, but we're not going to do that. In the eighth, Wirtz is up oh, again sorry. with two men on run out. Go back one more time. Okay, you know how hard it is to talk about nonverbal things to students without demonstrating it. Well, that is particularly true. I don't know why I'm having such a hard time doing this. I'm trying to get on Bojangles. That's particularly true, say, of jazz, nonverbal jazz, but it's true of the dance as well. And many people think that Bojangles is the greatest dancer in the 20th century. But now you can bring Bojangles into the classroom. Isn't that marvelous? Malcolm X, one of the great figures in, in black history. Um, sorry. Let's see what Malcolm has to say this Black History Month. We go to the article on Malcolm X. These are all very long articles. You just scroll down. You know the drill. All this is streaming media along the top. That's um, just um, that icon there just means it's an audio clip. This icon means there, there's historic film footage. Who are you? You don't know. Don't tell me Negro. That's nothing. What were you before the white man named you a Negro? And where were you? And what did you have? What was yours? What language did you speak then? What was your name? It couldn't have been Smith or Jones or Bunch or Powell. That wasn't your name. <laughs> they don't have those kind of names where you and I came from. No, what was your name. And why don't you now know what your name was then? Where did it go? Where did you lose it? Who took it? And how did he take it? What tongue did you speak? How did the man take your tongue? Where is your history? How did the man wipe out your history? Yeah, great, Malcolm X. But we have um, Marcus Garvey um, giving a speech, film footage of him, and an audio clip. Booker T. Washington who recorded his 1895 Atlanta Exposition speech. We, have, we found a, a film clip of black people doing the cakewalk dance in 1903. It's in here. We have all kinds of things in here. It's just, it's just great. Now, I could keep you all day um, showing you that, but I want to show you the special features that we developed as well. Um, we have a library of black America in which we, and at this point in this edition, we have four million words of those encyclopedia articles. On top of those, as it were, it's hard. These are all metaphors because it's all digital. Are these features that I just clicked into? And the first one is the Library of Black America. We digitized 160 books written by black people between Phyllis Wheatley in 1773 and 1920, and they're all part. You, you get it as all part of the disc. It's not separate, and it's fully searchable. So if you wanted to find out, if uh, uh, an undergraduate came to me last year and asked me if anyone black in the 19th century wrote about Charles Darwin. So I turned around at my computer and I typed in Darwin. This icon means that it's in the Library of Black America. So you see five people wrote about Charles Darwin. And if we click on this book, is Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South, published in 1892. Watch what happens. You go right to the page 
273 of her book, and the word Darwin is highlighted. It revolutionized scholarship in African American um, uh, um, African American studies. In addition, we have an interactive timeline that goes from Lucy, our common human ancestor, four million years ago, up to Bill Clinton's visit to Ghana a couple years ago, and it's fully interactive. Quincy and I developed a music timeline, which I'm going to show you at the very end. We have an interactive civil rights chronology, uh, uh, chronology, a history of the civil rights movement. We have lectures by Maya Angelou, Kofi Annan, An that's Anthony, my, my, my heart, <laughs> and me, Whoopi, uh, Q, Cornell West, Colin Powell. Cornell's on the struggle for black freedom. Cornell, um, Colin Powell's on the history of blacks in the military. Let's watch Quincy on black music. Sorry. What in the world am I doing here? Okay. Why does the majority of the wor world, uh, especially the young people, why do they choose American black music to be their voice, their anthem in life? You know, and I've, I've been to almost every place in the world. And without exception, the, the, the music that, that seems to speak for most of the youth in the world is, uh, is basically black American music. Probably because it comes from the deepest part of the human soul. The black experience in America is really written in the music, you know. Everything else was written by, you know, Uncle Tom Cavanaugh, all, all the, the other things were written by the, the victors and the conquerors. And you know how the conquerors write history. Mr. Charlie, Mr. Ludlow Joe, right on the side of old boy. I won't wipe no more. But the real history of what, what happened here is all, in all the spirituals, in the blues. You got a right to the tree on fire. Keep it there, man. You got a right to the tree on fire. Remember Langston Hughes said one time, he said, there's not too much difference between the field holler that uh, the slaves used to use when they picked cotton and Coltrane when he plays in New York City. black music in general it belongs to the whole race everybody it really does because everybody's voice is involved in it and every blues thing you see it would be maybe Whitney this year that comes out of the church you know or Dinah Washington years ago or Aretha Franklin after that it's all one person really you know to me it feels like one person that it and they take all of the things that have come down all of the years, you know, from slavery to spirituals to this and that, and they keep piling it up and adding something to it, and it just keeps on growing. And that's why it's so important that for young people to go back and define where you're coming from, because if you don't know where you're coming from, it's hard to know where you're going, you know? Mm -hmm. Quincy Jones. So then we have... Um um, um, film clips from my Africa film series, I mean, little mini lectures. We take you to Great Zimbabwe, to Timbuktu, to the slave coast of Ghana, to the Swahili coast. That's a Dow, that boat where I met that guy. The Kingdom of Kush, which is the home of the black pharaohs, the Nubians. And then Lalabella, the rock hewn churches of Lalabella in Ethiopia. Um, I'll take you quickly to Timbuktu. Then we'll do one more thing, and then we'll look at this timeline, and then I'll answer a few questions. Timbuktu is one of the world's legendary cities, deep in the Sahara Desert, in the West African nation. I'm of riding Mali. on this camel with this group of people. Founded in the 11th century, and I was scared. It was a death. port on a sea of sand, and grew rich on trans-Saharan trade. Salt, carried across the desert, was so valuable that it was exchanged ounce for ounce for gold. We shot all this film. By the 16th century, That's me Timbuktu walking into was the, at its peak drawing scholars and students from all over Africa. This mosque was the site of a great university, the first in sub-Saharan Africa. 
These medieval manuscripts, written by Africans, bear witness to a once flourishing trade in books. The mighty river Niger was the trading artery of the great kingdom of Mali. Goods crossed the Sahara Desert on camels, then were transferred to boats that journeyed upriver to Timbuktu's sister town of Jene. Jene, with its extraordinary mud architecture, has been described as the jewel of the Niger and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Ever since Islam was introduced to Mali around the 11th and 12th centuries by Arab traders, Jene has been the most holy city in West Africa. And the great mosque at Jene is still one of the most important sites in the Islamic world. That great. So we can take people to all those places. Now, we have a lot of features on African geography, um, like this interactive African map, which through which that serves as a template. We can convey information about geopolitics, topographical information, information about the flora and fauna, and the art and architecture, and about ethnicity. Anthony and I wanted this to be a real encyclopedia, so I'll show you how this works. Uh, aardvark, you want to see, show a student where aardvarks are? That's where aardvarks are. You want to see where cheetahs are in Africa? That's where cheetahs are in Africa. Now, I'm a giraffe man myself. So if you want to see where giraffes live in Africa, that's where giraffes live. You can go to a close-up of a giraffe and then to an encyclopedia entry on a giraffe. And they, we have film footage, so watch what happens. You're going to watch a giraffe being born. Boom. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Imagine if we'd had that. Imagine if we'd had that when we were kids. That would have been great. Um, just two more things. We did a big uh, feature on the, the slave trade. And it, we counted the slaves. We can count 12 million slaves. We counted the slaves. It sounds like a tautology that we can count. What it means is that we went through all the shipping records and the shipping companies. After all, it was capitalism. We had good records. And we can count just under 12 million slaves shipped from Europe to the New World between 1519 and 1867. But I put this um, particular map in here because I wanted to show the cultural continuities. For those of you who love black music, you, mean you understand what I'm about to say. Each of these dots represents a cultural artifact in the New World which is directly traceable to Africa. So ring shout ceremonies come from that swath there. Uh, Vodun, the, also known as voodoo, is a synthesis of religions from Benin, Togo, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Angola. The tango is a dance brought from Congo and Angola by the slaves. Capoeira, the uh, sort of the very ball balletic um, form of martial arts, and I'll show you how it's all linked up. If we look at Caboera, which comes from Angola, we click on there, we get a little summary of it, and then we can go to the encyclopedia entry on Caboera, and then we have film footage, so watch this. Capoeira, an Afro-Brazilian ritual developed by African slaves in Brazil, is simultaneously a fight and a dance. The style of Capoeira regional emphasizes grace, fast reaction, and acrobatic moves. Here, Mestri Casara leads the group in La Dainha Song, while the Capoeiristas demonstrate their art. Capoeira Angola is the more traditionally African form. Here, Mestri Joao Granji plays with a younger Capoeirista while Mestri Joao Pequeno plays the barimbao, an Afro-Brazilian stringed instrument. Our point was to show students that the slaves who sailed in the New World to the New World, despite the horrendous treatment in the Middle Passage, did not sail alone. They brought their music. They brought their gods. They brought their systems of metaphysics along with them. And that, you know, our, our spirit was not crushed. I mean, we created a new African culture in the New World. Uh, now I want to show you the music timeline. The, our first edition was such, did so well that we decided that one of our goals was to get more black kids on the Internet. And what's the thing black kids respond to? They respond to black music. So, sorry about that. So why don't we do an interactive music timeline? So we sat with Q, and this is what we did. We start in 1870 with the Fist Jubilee Singers. It's fully interactive. We click on there, you get a, get a close-up of the Fish Jubilee Singers. Then we can 
go back to the timeline by hitting the go back button. There's minstrelsy. I don't know if you've ever seen a minstrel routine, but you can now. And this is important for students to understand. Can the lady sing this song? Do da, do da. Can the race that five mile long? Oh, do da day. Oh, the long tail filly and the big black horse. Do da, do da. They came to a river and they couldn't get across. Oh, do da day. Flying run all night, flying run all day. I bet my money on a bobtail nag. Somebody bet on the bay. Isn't that horrendous? But magnificent, too. Um, I'll just show you a couple things more, and then I'll answer some questions. Everyone knows about Marian Anderson, 1939. Well, now you can go to the Lincoln Memorial. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the big round world. In his hands, he's got the wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the wind and the rain. In his hands, he's got the moon and the stars. In his hands, he's got the wind and the rain. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. I mean, we have, um, you know, Louis Armstrong in performance. We got Bessie Smith from St. Louis Blues and. 1929. We have. Um, sorry, I do not want to go back there. <laughs> you know, we have all all the genres, but I want to sh take you back up to um, 1959. Then we end with hip hop. If we go to 1960, you can go backwards in time. If you just left your pointer on there, it would take about an hour and a half, and you just run through all the genres. But. Let's go to modal jazz. This is 1959, very rare footage. Miles and Coltrane. That marvelous and Coltrane, God. And then we end with hip hop. Um, we went out to um, Sir Mix a Lot's studio. I never heard of Sir Mix a Lot. That's Michael when he was still black. That is one crazy Negro, I tell you that. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far. Okay, it's Sir Mix a Lot. So we, we wanted to show the kids where hip hop comes from. So we decided to do it this way because this guy's pretty articulate. We interviewed him all day and then made this. What I do, first of all, uh, pretty much all rappers do the same thing. I have a sampling drum machine uh, slash sequencer. And what I do with this is I write little snippets of patterns, little pieces of, uh, of music, so to speak that I glue together later in song form. Um, example, uh, how a beat is built. We pick up our sounds. We don't just steal them. We sample them from they steal them. drum sets or whatever. And just to give you an example, here's some of the sounds. You know. We program the stuff on the, on the key, keyboards for as far as bass lines, horns, uh, synth sounds. We play all that, and this machine remembers that. So if I were going to write drums to this, We take and little snippets like so that. So you can see that you can use this, one, to teach the history of black music in a really compelling way, and simultaneously to seduce kids, you know, onto the Internet, into this technology. Let me end 
with a virtual tour. We sent photographers with a 360-degree camera to Bahia, to Black Paris, to Gore Island in Senegal, to Harlem, Habana, Medinet Habu in Egypt, Great Zim, and Serengeti. I'm going to end by taking you uptown to Harlem. Um, if I hold my... I'm going to take you to the Apollo Theater. Go to the Apollo. Let's see who's playing. Let's see Apollo. Uh, Duke's playing. Billy Holiday's playing. Aretha. Let's check out Aretha. <laughs> what you want, baby? In 1909, W.E.B. Du Bois woke up one day and decided that the most efficacious way to fight white racism and to bring respect to the persons of African descent is to edit an encyclopedia about the whole black world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, with the good graces of Microsoft and Perseus Books, that is what we hope we have done. Thank you very much. Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Dr. Skip Gates.